Thank you, Ricky. I just want to take the opportunity to thank Urban Age for inviting me back. And uh, I want to also recognize both uh, Ricky Burdett and Wolfgang Novak for their brilliance and hospitality. And I'm in so honored to follow Jamie Lerner, who's taught us to dream and to do uh, both together and never stop doing either one. So let me begin by talking about how aggressive, proactive government action can create a more livable city and by doing so incentivize successful and significant private investment. Let me start with, an ex to ex with the example of Lower Manhattan, reinvesting in the center of Lower Manhattan. Just to orient you, you see um, Manhattan on this map. Manhattan is a small part of New York City. Um, you can see in the top of the slide here, oops, um, I'm sorry. The, the, um, I'll just learn how to get the pointer very delicately here. Just at the bottom of the slide is uh, Lower Manhattan. To the middle of the slide is Midtown Manhattan, our two dense areas. Lower Manhattan is very much like Sao Paulo, a very dense city. We celebrate uh, density in New York City, uh, especially Lower Manhattan. Lower Manhattan has every advantage. It has fantastic architecture. It has uh, water all around, as you can see. It has an incredible transportation hub, the per perfect place to densify to have a more sustainable city. It is at the hub, the hub of the region, a great place uh, for the city to grow. However, even before the tragic events of September 11, 2001, Lower Manhattan was dying. It was deserted. It was deserted on the weekends. It was deserted at night. It was not taken care of. It was all commercial. There was no vitality on the weekends. There were no shops. There were no restaurants. We were losing. Three million square feet of office space left Lower Manhattan. For New York City, this was a tragedy because the core of our financial or economic base is our financial district, Wall Street. That's where most of our revenues come to pay for schools, sanitation, transportation, it was Lower Manhattan, and it was dying before 9-11. And you can see in this chart where you see it begin to go down, that was before 9-11. On September 11th, we lost 10 million square feet of office space, almost 13 million square feet of office space in Lower Manhattan. But before September 11th happened, we knew government had to take action. First, we started tax abatements for residential conversions. Second, after 9-11, a residential grant program to keep uh, residents in Lower Manhattan and bring uh, new residents to Lower Manhattan. Third, the federal government issued bonds uh, to create new development of residential growth in Lower Manhattan. This would bring office, not only with office, uh, a, a, a good office district needs to be mixed use. It must have that vibrancy. It must have uh, the residential life and, and the foot traffic that residential development uh, brings. So you see here a street populated by people sitting on the sidewalks. This is what happens with residential development. So the city took action not only by instituting regulatory reform, but also by building parks and open space. Quality of life brings private investment. We built new parks, and this began to give a sense of amenity, a place for social spaces, a peace place for people to spend time. And we built all along the lower part of this side where it's purple, a waterfront that was totally cut off from the public. This is what it looked like. This is what Wall Street had to look forward to. No wonder. No wonder our corporate firms were leaving Lower Manhattan. So we are creating a new waterfront esplanade, an esplanade for tourists, for residents, for families, for office workers. And this is the new Lower Manhattan. And look what has happened since, even before 9-11. Those government actions brought new residential development. First 10,000, and now since, since September 11th, 45,000 new residents in Lower Manhattan. New skyscrapers, this is Frank Gehry, and great architecture. Great architecture is very important to the energy and vitality of our cities. It makes them young, it makes them competitive. You have Frank Gehry and Helmut Jahn, 
and then that triggers new office development. Norman Foster, Richard Rogers, and these two already complete office buildings show that it's possible through government action to make things happen. The next project I'm going to talk about is one of my favorite projects in New York City. It is called the High Line. This is on the west side of Manhattan in the Meatpacking District, an area that was, is all zoned for manufacturing, no residential development. There is there an elevated, abandoned rail line, which had become a garden in the sky. This is called the High Line. This is elevated. It looks like a meadow. And it runs for 22 blocks, where you can walk on it. It connects neighborhoods. And it actually, you can walk without coming in contact with a single automobile. Now, developers hated it. They said, this has to be demolished. The demolition order was uh, issued. We were going to rip it down. 200,000 people signed petitions saying, save the High Line. And we saw this was not a blight on a neighborhood. This was an opportunity to attract private investment by something so unique as this elevated, an irreplaceable artifact, this high line that runs through neighborhoods. So what we did, the government actions were to rezone the area. This is where the art gallery district is. We kept it. That's what's in white. In yellow was new opportunity for residential development. And as a, a defining feature of this, the high line, this elevated garden in the sky that would create a district of value and attract private investment, not blight, but investment. And this is, we actually created very strict urban design controls so that we could predict the height and the shape of the buildings. Around the High Line, very strict controls to ensure light and air would reach the High Line. And through these controls, governmental controls, we have brought architects from all over the world to build around this area. An in international competition for the High Line, Liz Diller, Rick Scafidio, and James Corner. And this is the new design for the High Line. It looks like the old High Line. It is going to be one of the most unique and fantastic parks in the whole world. Another image of what it will look like, a flyover that brings you through a sumac meadow, totally unique. And because of this investment and government action, as I say, architects from all over the world are clamoring to build here, 32 projects in three years, and the park will open this spring. Here you have Annabelle Seldorf, Audrey Matlock, Jean Nouvel, uh, Frank Gehry, Shiguru Ban, and Neil Denari, all clamoring to build in this one space. So it is possible to have a dream, to implement it, to take action, and to create a great legacy for our administration, but really for the world. Thank you very much.